It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator, Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by EmailRevealer.com. Go to EmailRevealer.com, and you can catch your husband or your boyfriend cheating online. Uh, You send me uh, their email address, and I trace it back to online dating websites. We catch them cheating online. Uh, Also, check out OppermanReport.com, where we have exclusive content. You can become a member. You can sign up, and there's all kinds of uh, interviews and shows on there that we have... um, that you won't find free on Friday nights or on Saturday nights. And we just set up another little section on our document section where we're going to be loading up all the Donald Trump lawsuits and uh, oh, what else is going up there? Uh, mostly Donald Trump stuff lately. Uh, but anyway, OppermanReport.com. Sign up, become a member, help support the show. Uh, today we have a very, very exciting guest for you, Aphrodite Jones. Uh, she is the star of the Investigation Discovery uh, Channel TV show, a true crime with Aphrodite Jones on Monday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, brand new book just came out, Cruel Sacrifice. But today we're going to be talking about the uh, the Michael Jackson case, Michael Jackson conspiracy. So Aphrodite Jones, are you there? I am. Hi, Ed. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How are you? Thank you so much. Okay, great. Tell us about yourself. I mean, most people know who Aphrodite Jones is. Okay, people ever watch Court TV? Or investigation? Well, yeah, I'm not, that's not really true. I find a lot of people don't know who I am, but I've been on TV for 25 years. I have had eight true crime bestsellers. Three of them have been made into films. I have been doing TV, the talk show, so talk show circuit for many years back in time, and then um, you know more recently I, I've appeared on everything from CBS to NBC to MSNBC, Dateline, uh, you know. Uh, CNN, HLN, you name it, and I still do those appearances at times, even though I have my show on ID now, and um, my goodness, it's been a long career of 25 years of crime writing, crime reporting, investigative reporting, and being an author and a television commentator, so all in, yes, I covered the Michael Jackson trial for Fox News for Bill O'Reilly, and then I covered the Scott Peterson trial for Fox, as well as uh, the BTK killer, which is a huge serial killer story that uh, terrorized Wichita, Kansas for 30 years. So, I mean, it's been a large gamut of things, and um, like I say, many, many years in following crime stories and uh, trying to make sense of senseless things. Perhaps that's the best way to put it, and I do consider it a calling, Ed, because many people like the idea of true crime nowadays, not so much when I started, and I never liked it, and I still do not like it. It is not uh, something that I would have chosen for myself. I originally was a columnist that, that chronicled the evolution of cable television, and my job was to interview stars and have fun, and I had uh, a column about game shows and a column about uh, you know cable and a column about daytime soap operas and you know that was to me what I was my interest was to be in that world Um, it didn't turn out that way a girl got killed in Kentucky and she was an FBI informant and an FBI agent killed her and almost got away with it and I was so infuriated by the fact that nobody in the media covered it back in 1989 when it happened that I wrote a book proposal it was bought and I wrote the book not really knowing what I was going into because frankly I was so blind to think that the FBI would have cooperated with me. Um, But I did the book. It became a movie with Patricia Arquette starring as the woman who was killed and Stephen Weber as the FBI agent. Um, And that already was 20-some-odd years ago. So from there, when I wrote my second book, Cruel Sacrifice, which is now first time being released as an e-book ever, um, that book became a New York Times bestseller at number four on the New York Times list. And, And because of that, I then was considered a, quote, veteran true crime writer, and I couldn't get out of the field, though I wanted to, believe me. Um, I just couldn't, I couldn't sell anything other than true crime. Publishers didn't want anything other than true crime. 
I wound up stumbling on the story of Brandon Tina, which became my book, All She Wanted, which became the movie Boys Don't Cry, which launched the career of Hilary Swank. And from that point forward, with the Oscar in place and all the rest of it, it was just virtually impossible for me to do anything other than true crime. And so uh, I realize it's a calling because I do have um, an empathy for the victims very much so. I have dealt with killers in prisons. I still do. Um, sometimes I have empathy for them. Sometimes they're wrongfully accused. Other times I really wonder how it is they live with themselves and believe their lies. Mostly it's that, but I have dealt with people who have been exonerated as well. And um, at the end of the day, I guess I lost my parents when I was young. And so seeing it as a calling has to do more with the fact that I understand the pain of loss. And it's something that, unfortunately, I have to live with every day, even though it's been so many years, um, 40 years. It's still doesn't matter. I still suffer with, I wish my parents were here to see what I'm doing or, you know, watch my, you know, watch my accomplishments or my getting married or whatever it is. And so it's the, it's the thing that, that connects me to victims. Wait a second. How did you lose your parents? Did I miss something there? They were the uh, crime victims? They were not crime victims. No, they just, they just both died relatively young. Each of them of heart attacks at different times, but within a short period of each other. And uh, and that's just just how it was. My mom always had a heart trouble, so she she died young, and then my father died not long after. So it was just one of those freak things because at 17 years old, you don't you don't think that you're gonna ha- have no parents, you know. So um, anyway, it's it it's always stayed with me. It's something I live with, and um, like I say, it's uh, it never goes away. And so I I do understand the emotional trauma that people go through, especially when you lose somebody you meet overnight. There's no my both my parents had heart attacks, so while it wasn't violent, it was still absolutely shocking because they were fine when I left the house. When I came back and they were gone. Both of them. Forever. Both of them. Yeah, each of them. So, you know, that experience is so so jolting and of course, it's worse when there's a murder involved. There's no doubt of that. I'm not. I don't compare my life in any way or shape or form to an actual victim of a crime. But I do understand that what it feels like to have someone there one minute, and and everything is fine, and then not have them there the next. You know, it's it's a very uh, crazy. Uh, it's not natural. Let me put it that way. It's just not natural. I mean, most of most people have some kind of illness, some kind of warning, some kind of something, and you can at least start to grieve or be upset or prepare yourself or not prepare yourself, whatever the case may be. But you have a you have a hint, you have a clue. And in a murder story, in a in a any of the cases I cover are murders, other than Michael Jackson being the sole exception. Although you could argue he was murdered by. Uh, Conrad Murray, which is a separate subject. I mm. was at that trial as well. But, um, you know, it's just, it, it does feel the same way. Like the person was taken from you, whether it's because of the medicine they were on was wrong, whether it was because they just had a heart attack and no one caught it, whether it's because, um, you know, someone decided to take them out for whatever reason. The, the end of the day, justice or no justice, you don't have your loved one forever and ever more. And that's really the thing in common that that I can empathize with, with, with the people I, I have to, you know, grapple with on a daily basis in what I do. And so I would say that's who I am. So, so that's interesting. You know, cause you say because, you know, you were the you went through this trauma. It, it makes you mm-hmm. sympathetic toward the victims. Whereas some of these people who become serial killers go through that sometimes an identical trauma as you did. But instead, it deadens something in them and, and sets them off on this path of, uh, you know. Well, you know, interestingly enough, Ed, I, I try very hard to stay away from serial killer stories. And I'll tell you why. I did cover the BTK, and it really affected me when I was at the sentencing, watching these families who had been, like I say, terrorized by this monster for 30 years. And he held a job uh, – kind of a like a dog catcher type of job literally like he was a a, a town employee so he had access to the, the his office was in the same building as the police station so he was a, a a county city worker 
And all those years, he was killing people and taunting and torturing um, the Wichita area. Um, it, 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 when I had to face those victims and actually interview them and talk to them, I, I get chills just as I'm speaking with you now. I wept like a child. I'll never forget in that airport in, Kansas, uh, in, in Wichita in Kansas. I, I just, I couldn't bear the pain that was caused to these people, to these families. And in the case of a serial killer, what strikes me is there's no, there's no rhyme or reason whatsoever. It's just completely senseless. It's completely insane. You can't find a lesson in it. You can't see how we can make this world a better place from it. In that case, to me, those people have uh, something off in their genes, in, in, the, in, in the genetic code. And I, actually, there have been recent books about the anatomy of a, of, of a killer that um, it, 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 there is proof now that there is a part of the brain that is different in, in the mind of a killer, any killer, um, but in particular serial killers, where they don't have any sense of consequence, empathy, uh, sympathy, anything. They just don't, they don't, it doesn't, they don't think that way. Um, and their propensity for violence, since they have no sense of consequences, is, can, can occur and then escalate and they enjoy it. And for me, that's not something I want to, a road I want to go down because it's, it's just sickness. You know, it's just a sickness. And I, to me, those people should be locked up forever and throw away the key. And they usually are. The problem is that, to catch them. Um, and it, it, it's just very, very um, – I, I find it frustrating because there's nothing I can do. In the, in the murder cases I cover, in the books I've written and in all the, the episodes I've done, I'm in season six now at, at ID, each story has a lesson, whether it's, you know, you should have – that your sister-in-law was having this trouble and was starting to maybe you got hints that she was being abused and you didn't realize you could have made that report you could have gone to her you could have done something like her husband was plotting something or you knew about an affair and you know the, the girlfriend was jealous whatever the case may be there's always some love triangle there's always some money angle greed angle but if you can start to you know actually pay attention to your family and and friends and you know rather than uh, turn the other cheek and say it's not my business. Maybe it should become our business because it, it's possible you can save someone's life. And you know that said, are we going to save everyone's lives? No. But if you saved one life, we would be worth it. And I know people are paying more attention, especially in our era today. I mean, we're living in an era where you know it's not okay anymore to just say let the police handle it. We're all going to just you know walk around blindly. You know, I think people are looking over their shoulders a little more, and they should be. Um, I think people realize that the police aren't going to be the panacea to the be-all and the end-all to make their problems go away, and if there's violence and danger around on any level, and this goes across all classes and all races. This isn't just about gang shootings or, you know, ghetto things. This is mostly about middle-class people that, you know, you would never suspect teen girls would murder another teenager or in the book Cruel Sacrifice, or that teen kids would, would murder a girl's parents um, because they put, are pretending they're vampires, which is mm. another book I wrote, The Embrace. You know, you would never, in Florida, you know, in beautiful Orlando, you would never, ever expect these things to be real, and yet they are. And so it's something that uh, I, I really, truly, it's close to my heart, and, but with a serial killer, to try to answer your question, I don't know what the, what I've studied of them, and I have studied it over the years. There is, other than saying that there's something wrong genetically with them, which goes for any killer, by the way, any sociopath or psychopath has those same traits. But with a serial killer, they still don't know, you know, enough about the brain to say it, it's this, this, and this. It, whether or not it's there's a sociological component, I don't think there is. I just think those people are, like I said, sick sick individuals and um and i think also once they've killed one it's, it's easier to kill another and it's it's very uh, for whatever reason gratifying to them satisfying to them I, I, that's what i've learned 
And knowing that, I don't want to give them any inch of my time. Let, let me ask you, you know? this. Now, you sat through the whole BTK trial? No, no, only the sentencing. Only the sentencing. No. Well, he, yeah, he pled guilty. Right. No, right. Right. But let me ask you a question. Because even in the, uh, the sentencing phase, um, or something always, do, do you think he acted alone? Oh, absolutely. I know he did. What do you make of those pictures of him in bondage? How was he able to take those pictures? He's in he's in women's clothing and lingerie and bondage yeah, tied up, he, he, buried in he dirt. He actually staged it. They talked about it during the sentence. Yeah, he staged it, and, and he had a camera set up in the basement of his parents' house, and he was able to put the camera on a tripod and actually stage it so he could take pictures of himself in his victim's underwear and with his victim's clothing on and 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 bondage and all of that. He he was that sick. He actually at one point dug a grave and apparently uh, the victim he was planning on killing didn't it didn't work out for him if you want to say it that way and apparently he got into the grave and twisted himself up into this shallow grave and took pictures of himself in there yeah i've seen it oh you saw that yeah okay. and, and that's why i'm wondering now they explained this to you in a way that you were convinced that, that he did absolutely this absolutely convinced okay. absolutely convinced this man acted alone in fact i i, I was with the kansas state investigation people i was not just with the wichita police i was with the you know every state has their own investigation uh, arm in other words like there's the fbi but then there's a, the, the kbi kansas bureau of investigation there's the you know every state has their own um, bureau of investigation locally yeah. and the kansas bureau of investigation people i mean we went to the locations where this man pulled off these murders we went we talked about beyond what went on at the sentencing, what was revealed. And I will tell you this. He would sit and, and wait and watch a person's house. And he would spend weeks. Apparently he must have told them this. But I, 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 if there's no question in my mind. Weeks watching their every move. And eventually what he did, he had a five-minute timer. He would go break into the back of the house. And if the person didn't show up on their routine within five minutes, he left. And there was one woman who actually got home. And what he did is he cut all the phone cords. This is back in time. There are no cell phones. Mm -hmm. Cut all the phone cords, you know, um, was in the house. And, you know, with his accoutrement, his stocking on his head, and just very, I mean, the boogeyman is beyond, we can't even call him that. I don't know what you call him. And um, one woman came home in the midst of the 30 years and all the signs were there that BTK was there. The lines were cut. She had altered her pattern. She, she called her son. He came over and she had come home after the five minute window, like maybe 10 minutes later or something. And they knew his operandi enough that they realized it was him. The, the son took her out of the house and the woman never went back into the house ever. Somebody else had to go in and move her stuff out. Oh, boy. I mean, this is the kind of thing. Also, he had a very creepy thing he did. He would take photographs from magazines and cut out the face, and he would paste it onto, like, a cardboard, and he would drive around in his car with the face of somebody as he's driving around like that was his friend. But what he was doing was looking for someone out there in the streets that looked like this person. Okay, I, I mean, the stuff I found out on him, on, 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 on Dennis Rader, is so creepy, so bizarre. Frankly, no movie has done it justice. No book that I know of. I, 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 I can't say that because I haven't read any books. I don't want to know more about it. I know too much. I know enough to know this guy acted alone. There's no doubt in my mind. There were caches of these weird pictures found in the police precinct office that he had. Um, you know, all the mementos, his creepy taunting of the police, uh, very Zodiac-like, mm. and um, but worse, because ultimately, at some point, he killed someone that lived five houses down from him. So he was just getting more brazen and more brazen and more brazen over years. And, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, no, he, no one helped him. Okay. I, I don't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. Now, you discuss about how you have sympathy for the victims, all right? Extraordinary sympathy or empathy, you might call it. Uh, but yet in the Michael Jackson case, 
Uh, I guess you started out like everybody else, assuming. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then how did you come to this place? I tell you the truth. I, when I booked this interview, all my interviews about Michael Jackson has always been that he's, he's guilty. And I'm convinced mm-hmm. he's guilty. So, and I was shocked to, to see this today. So, so convince me. Go ahead. Oh, well, there's no, no, there's, there's no question that he was innocent. Let me tell you, that trial in Santa Barbara, Santa Maria, actually, it was in Santa Barbara County, was such a circus. It was such a sham that really the media should be ashamed all the way across the board for having done what they did. It was like a lynching of Michael Jackson, and I'll tell you why. Everyone went there with the preconceived notion that he was guilty, which, by the way, is not the way we're supposed to handle trials. But okay, it's the media. However, everybody also only wanted to cover what was the most salacious, the most damning, the most potentially damning information of the trial. And that went also for my work at Fox News, where they only wanted me on when it was, you know, the most damning information. And if I had anything to say that was um, exculpatory-ish, which I wasn't really believing he wasn't guilty throughout the trial. So I didn't have a lot to say, but even if I wanted to reveal some things that seemed exculpatory, it wasn't. there was no interest in that from the producers. Because that's the mentality everybody seemed to have in covering that trial. It was like Casey Anthony, where all of us believe she was guilty, and I still believe she's guilty, but... You know, the surprise at the end that she didn't get found guilty was, like, shocking. I wasn't surprised well, one bit. I predicted that. They never proved. They never proved even cause of death in that case. You well, know? you're right. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, I, and so yeah. it turned out that way. And I actually did an episode on it for, on True Crime, if you ever get a chance to see it. it I'd love to get you back on a show about that because I want to do a Casey Anthony show, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Well, we can do that. I covered that entire trial. I was there gavel to gavel. Um, n- nonetheless, back to Michael Jackson. Um Here's the thing. When the jury came back not guilty, I had my jaw dropping like everybody else. But as they continued to say not guilty for all 14 counts, there was like literally like a curtain came up from over my eyes. It was like all of a sudden I realized the emperor had no clothes, the emperor being Tom Sned and the prosecutor. Why? Because this family of accusers, had gone after Chris Tucker, who testified, George Lopez, who testified, Jay Leno, who testified, and I can continue to name more, Larry King, who overheard, and his, their lawyer, who they hired, guess who they hired? Larry Feldman, who was the lawyer for Jordy Chandler. They didn't go to the police about being sexually molested. They went to Larry Feldman, Jordy Chandler's lawyer. How coincidental that... They get to Michael Jackson after they've already bilked because the kid had cancer. They bilked George Lopez. He testified to it. They bilked Chris Tucker on the set of Rush Hour, and they wanted hotels, and they wanted to move hotels, and they wanted this, and they wanted that, and they went, Lopez was doing charity drives for them for blood, and it turns out they had insurance. They didn't need that for blood. Ba 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 ba. Everybody that testified had another story. Jay Leno said, it was a make-a-wish request, and he said the kids sounded overly effusive. Overly effusive. Those were Jet Leno's words. And if you remember, Leno was making a career out of making fun of Michael Jackson being a pedophile back then. He testified as a witness for the defense, really only because they had him on tape saying what he was saying with the kid. And so, it, it, you know, the truth was that this kid, Gavin Arvizo, and the family were a living in the barrio of L.A., East East L.A., in a one-room apartment, a studio. So it's three kids and two parents, five people in a studio apartment. The kid winds up with cancer. He somehow goes to a camp where he's at a comedy store where all these performers are performing, Leno and Tucker and Lopez, etc., gain access to these people. After they go through whatever they can to get monies and favors and freebies and charity drives out of these people and others, local L.A. celebrities, then they hit the biggest mark of all, Michael Jackson. Bingo! Michael Jackson at that time wanted desperately to repair his image. He couldn't get through the payment he made to Jordy Chandler in the 90s. It's now in the 2000s. He desperately wants to have a, a makeover. He wants to get past it. 
he can't. Martin Bashir, enter Martin Bashir, Mr. Wonderful, who's done the only documentary on Princess Diana. And, of course, Michael loves to be a celebrity, loves to be thinking of himself as royalty, falls in love with this guy, Bashir, invites him to the United States. They make a deal, unbeknownst to any of Jackson's people, that Bashir will have complete and total access to Jackson for, I don't know how long, a year? And during that time, he's not even, he's not paying a dime. Jackson's doing it for free. Since when does a superstar do things for free? Because Bashir has convinced him, and this is all on tape. I've seen the tapes. We have full tapes of their interviews that were never seen on Bashir's documentary. How, how'd you get that? Us in Who, court. Where'd you get that from? It's, it, was, it was shown in court. Okay. Two and a half hours of footage that was never seen. Okay. So you, now, you, you got that from the defense then, or you watched it in court? I watched it in court, and I also have a copy. You of got it a copy, in okay. my safe. Yes, I do. I do. So here's the thing. Is Bashir convinced Michael Jackson, because Michael always had the thing he never had a childhood, which he didn't. I met Joe Jackson. He's uh, beyond a monster. I, I can't even explain. Not the kind of a killer monster, but just a sociological monster, okay? And we know Michael didn't have a childhood. He talked about it in the Bashir tapes, blah, blah, blah. And they're not tapes. They're videotapes. You see Michael. Um, and he wanted to have what he called national, an international children's holiday because in his mind, children weren't paid enough attention to, and, and especially children all over the world who are suffering and are, you know, in third world countries. And so he wanted to have an international children's holiday in which everything was about the child, that, you know, they would have, they could play, they could not go to school, they could have, you know, special events. In bedtime story. Uh, Sorry? It, it was in his Bill of Rights. They should all have a bedtime story. Oh, I don't know about a bedtime story. No, no, it's, he, he had a Bill of Rights he wanted for children, that they all should have a bedtime oh, story. Oh, okay, well, I didn't, do you see, you know more about that than I do. That yeah. was not brought up in the Bashir, uh, Bashir tapes. What was brought up was this international children's holiday. Right. And Michael talked specifically about things that he wanted children to have. And Bashir kept referring to it and saying, yes, we're going to talk about your special holiday and what you want to do for children, all the work you've done for children. Which, by the way, Michael Jackson did give to hospitals and children and go in in person and bring toys and stuffed animals. No one ever knows about that because no one ever heard about it because that wasn't interesting. But he did do it all his life. And, you know, so here's this family. Think about this. The Bashir documentary airs. Number one, Bashir picked that family because Michael had already helped the kid when he was in a wheelchair with no hair in his head, and that's when he brought them to Neverland to help this kid through his cancer. It wasn't until after the Bashir documentary aired that this family was long gone from Michael Jackson's life that suddenly, because Bashir managed to get the kid on the same bed with Michael, have them hold hands, which apparently, according to the family who, who, who testified, said was set up by, by Bashir, had them hold hands. They didn't testify to it. They talked about it in a taped interview for Michael Jackson before the trial. Then they changed the story in the trial. But the tape was shown to us. I also have a copy of that. The Arvizo family and Mrs. Arvizo, Janet Arvizo, the mother, said that Bashir put their hands together, suggested that they hold hands, now you have that moment where he asks them, so do you sleep in the bed together? And Michael, trying to make up for the past, says, oh, yes, we do. We have milk and cookies, and it's all wonderful and innocent. Boom. That thing goes viral. It goes around the globe. The whole world is calling Michael Jackson, CBS president, every president of every network, Barbara Walters, 60 Minutes, you name it. Of course they can't get through to Michael. Michael's people are horrified. How did he do this documentary without even telling anyone? The one thing he did do is hire his own videographer to tape everything just as a safety, which is what I'm talking about, what I have, okay? That's the only thing he did. That was his safeguard. Bashir ran with that, and he was the first person to testify, called to the witness stand by the prosecution at the trial. It was that documentary that led those people, the Arvizos, to go after Michael Jackson 
not as a criminal because they didn't report him to police, but for the money because they went to Larry Feldman, which is Jordy Chandler's right. lawyer that got the $25 million settlement. So now you're going to tell me that Michael Jackson, after the – and this is when they claim it happened, by the way. This is the timeline in trial. Not during when the kid had the – it was in the wheelchair and no hair on his head. It needed blood drives that Michael did for him. But after the Bashir documentary aired, when the Jackson camp said, get this family out of the burial, bring them up here so that they don't start giving, t- giving interviews to the National Enquirer and whatever they're trying to do, right? That's when they claim that Michael molested this boy while he's in the midst of a firestorm of media insanity all over the globe, this is when they say that Michael molested the boy. Now, think about that for a moment. Right. Okay. But but looking at Michael's history, it, it doesn't surprise me that much. Uh, yeah, except, except that. What do you think about the Jordy Chandler story? Do you believe that one? Michael was not interested in this boy okay. whatsoever. And actually... What was testified to is that the boy was upset because Michael had dumped him once the kid got healed and they did the documentary. Michael moved on. But these people kept coming back to Neverland because they wanted to feed off the fat of the land. Neverland is 2,700 acres. Neverland is not what people think. It's not an amusement park. It's 2,700 acres. Think about that. So they're living on the fat of the land. And he's realizing seeing Michael Jackson in and out of somewhere, some building in Neverland and realizing Michael's not having anything to do with him anymore. So the kid is hurt because he's thinking he's Michael's best friend because that's the way Michael was with kids and people. So, again, it, it, it goes on. I, I can tell you more if you read the book, you know, Michael Jackson Conspiracy, you'll understand that not only that – They claimed they were kidnapped, but yet they were taking limousines to and from L.A. She was using his money to get full body waxes and just insanity, complete insanity. And yet the media bought it, hook, line, and sinker, because it fit in with, like, you're asking me about the Jordy Chandler uh, narrative. And And then when he was found innocent, by the way, who talked about it? Nobody. Everybody packed up. 2,400 journalists, credential journalists, packed up. And, and we're gone. It wasn't what, a story anymore. We've got to take a commercial break. But <laughs> I, would just, I would love to ask you some questions right now. But let's take a little break. We're with Aphrodite Jones. The book we're talking about right now is Michael Jackson Conspiracy. But if you go to AphroditeJones.com, there's like, forget it. There's, there's a million books. Uh, another one I'm going to try and get into is Cruel Sacrifice. That It's a 20-year-old story, but it just came back up on a, a digital version available on Amazon. And don't forget, Investigation Discovery... True Crime with Aphrodite Jones, every Monday night, 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Eastern Time. Eastern Time. Pacific, uh, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm Pacific Standard Time. <laughs> I don't have a show. <laughs> okay. We'll be right back with more of uh, Aphrodite Jones uh, right after these messages. This is your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman. And if you're enjoying the show right now, th- there's more. You can get more. You can go to the Ed Opperman YouTube channel, and you can subscribe there. And we have archives of all of our past shows for over the past three years, about 200, 300 shows. Uh, you can also go to the Opperman Report Spreaker channel, and you can follow us there. Uh, again, a ton of shows, about 300 shows on there. And whenever we do an impromptu show, uh, an emergency-type broadcast that we do during the week occasionally, you'll get an email notifying you of breaking news and spontaneous broadcasts that we may do during the week. You can also go to oppermanreport.com and become a member. If you become a member, you help support the free archives on Spreaker and YouTube, and you help support the free shows on Friday evening and on Saturday evening. Each of these shows, Friday evening and Saturday evening, are carried for free on seven internet stations, okay? Uh, so you help support that, but also, too, at OppermanReport.com in the member section, we have exclusive content. Uh, shows that are recorded during the week that are only available to members. Uh, so please check out OppermanReport.com and help support the show. The son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement, 
Bernie Sanders. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. Bernie moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq War, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system that holds up a rigged economy. Bernie's campaign is funded by over a million small contributions from people like you. He's fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. Bernie Sanders. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders. Husband, father, grandfather. An honest leader. Building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Check out strawmanmusic.com. Sean Duff is our webmaster here at the Opperman Report, and uh, he's a very talented musician. He's part of a band called Strawman. They're based up there in Canada. Don't hold that against them. Uh, these are like-minded folks. If you like the shows you hear on the Opperman Report, you'll like the music that they have over at strawmanmusic.com. Enough is enough. Wall Street's greed and illegal behavior drove this country into the worst economic downturn since the 1930s. And then, after getting a huge taxpayer bailout because they were too big to fail, it turns out that three out of the four largest banks are bigger today than they were before we bailed them out. That's crazy. I'm Bernie Sanders. My plan Break up the big banks who are strangling our economy and make them pay their fair share of taxes. Then we can invest in the middle class, expand Social Security, and provide universal college education. I'll rein in Wall Street behavior so they can't crash our economy again. Will they like me? No. Will they begin to play by the rules if I'm president? You better believe it. I'm Bernie Sanders, Democratic candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. You know, you can get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator, if you go to my website, emailrevealer.com. Now, this is a limited edition book, okay? And you can get a signed copy of this book, and it'll be personally autographed to you or whoever you want to give the book to as a gift. Once you have my signature on that book, you can copy the signature and put it on checks and pass them all over the world. Emailrevealer.com. Get a copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator. He's fought injustice and inequality his whole life. Bernie Sanders. As a college student, he was arrested for challenging segregated housing. Bernie marched with Dr. King and thousands of others for civil rights. In Congress, Bernie stood up for working families on health care and jobs. Now he's taking on Wall Street banks and a corrupt political system that keeps in place a rigged economy. Bernie Sanders, a reformer who believes in ending racial profiling and mass incarceration, so the justice system works for everyone. Bernie Sanders. There is no president who will fight harder to end institutional racism and reform our broken criminal justice system. Bernie Sanders, an honest leader building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, candidate for president, and I approve this message. Paid for by Bernie 2016. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. We're here with Aphrodite Jones, author of Michael Jackson Conspiracy. You can also find Aph Aphrodite Jones on Investigation Discovery every Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, True Crime with Aphrodite Jones. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Actually, the show airs uh, all across the country. It's, it's on uh, 9 p.m. Uh, also. Pacific time. Okay, so. of course it would be. <laughs> okay, of course. All right, all right. I'm just so excited to ask you the next question. I'm kind of stumbling over myself here. Now, wouldn't, oh. wouldn't you agree? Okay, okay, the Orvizo family is a troubled family, okay? But wouldn't Beyond you agree? Beyond troubled. Well, I'm sorry? Beyond troubled. They're grifters. But now, wouldn't you agree that uh, pedophiles and convicted sex offenders target children from troubled families, just like Jordy Chandler was from a troubled family as well? Well, you know, here's the thing. 
if I hadn't heard the testimony of Chris Tucker, who talked about how they got to him and how they, uh, on the set of Rush Hour 2, were demanding, and how Chris went to Michael and said, watch out, Mike, Get, don't, don't let these people in your life. If I hadn't heard George Lopez testify that not only did he take them to his home and buy clothes and this and that for them, but that also they claimed that they lost their wallet at his house, and when he found the wallet, that they claimed there was hundreds of dollars that was in it that was missing, and Lopez's assistant apparently replaced that money when the money was never there. These are the kind of testimonies that came out during the trial. And again, Jay Leno saying that he got a call from this kid, and Leno is somebody who would make anyone's wish come true. He's truly a, a, a giving soul. I've, I've met the man. I've seen him do charity work beyond anyone's wildest dreams, and he testified that he did not trust the voice of this kid on the phone, that the kid sounded coached, he could hear a woman in the background, and he was, quote, overly effusive in asking for whatever favor it was. These people were grifters. And Lopez, by the way, they hounded for fund drive, fundraiser blood drives to the point that he had done some of it, and then he couldn't continue to do more, and they were after him and hounding him. He testified to this. Right, I, right, I, right. I, I, I'm I willing to concede. All, you know, quoted in the book. I'm willing to concede that they're, they're grifters, okay? Uh, may not be my opinion, but I'm willing to concede that point uh, because I don't think it's that important. Uh, because even the parents, again, of Jordy Chandler's, they've been accused of being grifters as well. Uh, and they mm. they would negotiate. And I've read the transcripts, too, of the negotiations between Pelicano and the father uh, over that little boy. Um, I have to. Sorry? I have to. Yeah. So, okay, then, then you know what I'm talking about. And Pelicano today, people should note, is in prison. Uh, this is Michael Jackson's private investigator. He's in prison uh, for possession of uh, C4 explosive and hand grenades and all kinds of activities. But that had nothing to do with Michael Jackson, by the way. But I it's, mean, it's the guy he chose to hire. It doesn't matter. To negotiate because, with a kid. Well, I was at his sentencing. He's his own man. Let's okay. remember that. Jackson wasn't the only one who hired uh, Mr. Pelicano. What, but go on. What, what, what do you make of the Jordy Chandler case? What I make of the Jordy Chandler case is entirely a different matter. Okay. Because, you know, uh, that's a situation where, for whatever reason, Michael gave a $25 million payout um, and from what I do know through the Pelicano tapes and transcriptions, from what I saw, Jan June Chandler testified at the Arvizo trial, at the Jackson trial. And all I can say is all of it seemed very um, questionable to me. Um, however, nothing was proven. And with that said, at the end of the day, you know, one of the things that I always find curious with Michael Jackson is that he did have the mentality of a child, it seems, uh, up until the day he died. He really just never, whatever part of his brain that got stuck in the adolescent child phase stayed there. And because of that, if you'll notice, any of these accusers who uh, are, have been given their million dollars or whatever they were able to eke out of Jackson over the years, if you'll notice, none of them have ever said that he raped them. None of them have ever said that he there was actual intercourse. None of them have ever said that the kind of, of sexual acts that, that are unspeakable but that they would have referred to with trying to get the monies out of Jackson that they did. So I, I, I truly believe that he had a need for that an adolescent kind of exploratory, if you will, sexuality, if that's what it was. And I don't believe anything more than that went on, honestly. Does that make him a pedophile? I mean, yeah. the answer is it, it, doesn't, it doesn't clear him of being a pedophile. But I, I was not, I am not present. There was no trial with Jordy Chandler. And the kids who testified, by the way, at the Arvizo trial, some of them said that they were scarred for life because Michael Jackson tickled me over my pants, over my jeans. And somehow they were able to squeeze a million dollar settlement out of him. Well, because, I got to tell I you, Aphrodite, you know, I'm a grown man now, but from when I was 13 years old, if a grown man was tickling me, my genitals through my jeans, I would be, I, I would remember that to this day. You remember it. Would you be I, so, uh, would that have caused you to have to go into therapy for 10 years? 
I think I've been to therapy for less than that. (laughs) You know, Uh, yeah, I cannot, I can't condone that. Okay, whatsoever. And and also, too, you talk about how. I'm why not would he? Anything. I'm just questioning the veracity yeah, of the statements of these people. I'm condoning nothing. Uh, you think I'm condoning pedophilia? No, no, I don't think I said that. Okay. Well, what I'm saying is, uh, you, you say that. Uh, you th- All I'm saying. No, is no, no. no I'm asking a specific a question. Of the trial right. that happened in Santa Maria. Right, and, and you're saying that there's the, no doubt of that. You, you don't in think my mind whatsoever. You read the book and you will see he was set up from the get-go by Martin Bashir and then the prosecutor and the Scripter family. What happened in the past with each individual case is also something for scrutiny, something for question, and something that in the case of Jordy Chandler, I really have to think twice about because I'm not willing to go that far to say that nothing happened there. I think that that would be foolish of anybody to think that nothing happened there. But I am also saying to you, Ed, that on some bizarre level, for Michael Jackson, a -a one-of-a-kind person in this world, he had a -a one-of-a-kind proclivity that was perhaps, I mean, obviously destroyed kids, minds, or whatever happened, I don't know, but it it was, I believe in his mind, he was still that age and it was okay. It wasn't, it, 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 it's not clear to me that you can put him in a category of what we consider to be pedophiles. I, was, I don't think he felt he was going after young kids. That's the point. Well, I think yeah, but, he thought he was a peer of these kids. Yeah, but who cares what he thinks? He's still down. It, it's what the law is, first of all. But my question is this. You keep saying that um, after he was taped holding hands with this little boy in the Bashir video, that it would just be unreasonable and unthinkable for him to then start molesting this kid when all the scrutiny was upon him. Months and months later. Right. And yes, and I'll tell you why. No, but, but, but first, why would, uh, in the Jordy Chandler case, he was in their home in this kid's bedroom for days and days and days, not leaving that bedroom. That's pretty extreme. That. Yeah, that's pretty extreme behavior as well. I think he gets off on that kind of extreme uh, mm. Taunting. And the problem. The and, problem is testimony of the two two boys that were the the Arvizo boys don't match as to when when this quote unquote molestation occurred and who witnessed it. Number one, number two, according to the kid's own mouth, he wasn't sure if he was molested two, three, or four or five times. Um, there's a lot of problems with their testimony. I have the police tapes as well, and I will tell you that they are not believable. The jury. The foreman of the jury, who I interviewed for my show, True Crime, I did an hour on this, okay, said that the jury, the, the, the final crowning piece was that they did not believe not only the testimony of the accuser, but nor did they believe the initial statements of the accuser to the police. And they watched that video over and over again to see if there was any truth to it. I have that video. I've seen the video. I've watched it myself a few times. And I asked the court clerk when I was watching that video the first time, I don't have a 13-year-old boy. I don't have a teen child. Is this how a teen child would discuss having sex or being involved in sex with anybody? And she said, absolutely not. So all I can go by is what the jury thought, what uh, impartial parties thought, and what I now think looking at it. The kid, yes, kids don't like to talk about being molested, and you get that, and you know that. You go in watching the video thinking that, you get that. But this kid was having police put words in his mouth, and you watch it, and you see it. And so, again, uh, there's a reason the jury found Michael Jackson innocent. And it wasn't because they were, you know, uh, impressed by his stardom. Believe me. These people took their jobs very seriously. I interviewed not just the foreman, more than one juror on that on that trial. And these people took their job very seriously, and they sat there, they listened to all the evidence, and they realized what it was. It was a game by a bunch of grifters who were looking for a big payout. And it was a way for a prosecutor, namely Tom Snedden, to get back at, at Jackson for the case he never was able to try regarding Jordy Chandler because there was a settlement. That's what that was all about. Uh, My opinion, and I will never change it because I lived it 
Okay, I'll clarify a couple of things for me. You, you said you've never had any teen children yourself. No, I don't have any children. Okay, I was just checking. Okay. Now, uh, just to clarify, you know, I'm, I'm a defense investigator. I, I, I like to, you know, I want my clients to see a fair trial at, every time. And I don't mind if my client gets a better deal than he deserves. You know, I, I, I'll go along with that. Uh, so I have no problem with, with a guy getting off on a case. Now, as far as Snedden goes, he has no history of any kind of complaints against him, does he? He has a history of going around the world trying to find people to charge Michael Jackson with uh, molestation against. Did you know that? Yeah. He actually would do the country to try to bring people in to try to continue to try Michael Jackson. It was a mission for him for his life. Well, because some of, that? some of these other – yeah, sure. I, I know this case very well. And, and so, even, even before, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of this case before Jordy Chandler. I've heard about these allegations before – Jordy Chandler became public. I, I didn't want to spring that on you, but, you know. No, but the thing is. I've heard about the allegations, too. I mean, none of us are living in a bubble here. Okay. I mean, I have friends who claim they've seen him with little boys in Mexico on the elevator. I don't know. I, I wasn't there. You weren't there. All I know is that from what I'm telling you, the trial that happened in Santa Maria was a sham. And it was a game. Now, what happened prior to that, some of it I don't know if I believe. Some of it maybe I do believe. I don't know what to believe anymore because the man is dead and gone. But I will say this. Without a doubt, the media wanted to lynch Michael Jackson, and they managed to do it because after that trial, he never really recovered. He left the country, and by the time he got back here, he was already you know, physically and mentally gone. That's what happened to Michael Jackson. Right. You, you know what? See, I, I'm not too so concerned. Is that the focus of your book is that he was treated unfairly by the media? No. The focus of my book is what happened in the trial. Right. Okay. Now, because besides, and, I, and you, you talk about the Bashir video, but besides, you know, he, he talked about sleeping with other boys in his bed, the, the, the Macaulay Calkin boy and his younger brother, uh, but it was all innocent and it was all okay. Uh, now, that, that alone... Uh, should raise concern, but but also too on there on video he seemed by I'm the sorry? way that nothing ever happened. You do know that I do know that, but still it, it's uh, it, more than wildly inappropriate for a grown man to be sleeping in a bed with with strange little boys. Ed, Ed, yeah. why are we having this conversation? How many people have had this conversation for years on end? We know that we feel it's inappropriate. Right. It's not a question. Do you think that I'm sitting here saying, oh, it's, it's, everybody sleeps with little boys in their bed? Of course we know that's not the case. What, it, Michael Jackson had a chimpanzee named Bubbles. Right. Okay? I mean, Who was also abused, by the way. You, you know, I mean, what, what was it about <laughs> Michael Jackson's life that was normal? Exactly. Right. It's a pattern of behavior. Like, even in the Bashir video, he's dangling no, no. his Talking infant. about all the aspects of his life. Yeah. Right. Not just... Not just the accusations about whether or not he was a pedophile, but all the other bizarre things he had in his life. What, what, what's the pattern of having chimpanzees and llamas and animals and wanting the friends? Of the, the, he would talk about how animals were his friends. He wanted to have a celebrity animal birthday party. I mean, what is normal about Michael Jackson? Right, nothing normal, uh, I including his disregard for his own children, that he dangled a baby from a, a terrace. Yeah, and, and that is such an unfair characterization of him, by the way. That really? was part of the Bashir documentary, which Bashir was lucky enough to have been brought along to Germany with Jackson in his one-year hour, one year tour uh, with Michael. And by the way, Michael held that baby up because he had hundreds, if not thousands of fans below, waiting and wanting to see his new baby. If you watch what Michael said about it, which you can't because it's on the tapes that were never shown, Michael says, I never was holding the baby out so that he could be falling. I showed my fans my baby because they were begging to see him. I held him up for a second, or two, a few seconds, so they could see him, and the media ran it over and over and over again, making it look like I was trying to throw my baby over a balcony. 
I have that tape. And, well, yeah, I heard him say that too. But my God, it, it is. Compl- I can't think of anything more irresponsible than holding. Whether well, the fans are screaming, I don't care if it's a million fans. I don't care if they got guns down there. I'm not going to hang my kid over the, the balcony. I don't know that you would be having a balcony with hundreds of people underneath you begging you to show them your baby either. <laughs> okay. Even if they set fire to the building, I wouldn't hang my baby out the window. My God. This, okay. Well, and he I, held them for 15 seconds. I, even one second. Say, for what point? For what point? To it, show it, his fans who were begging to see the baby. You know, here's the thing, Ed. Yeah. And, and this is what really, what you've got my hair standing up on its end, is that everything you're saying are all the uh, accepted inappropriate behaviors of Michael Jackson that just for for whatever reason, because the media decided to blow it up beyond belief, is just, that's all we're going to remember about this person. You know, you try having a camera on you every minute of your life and stalkers and paparazzi and everything else. You see what that feels like. I got a taste of it being at that trial, and let me tell you, it was not fun. Not fun. And so, you know, you, you can't look at Michael Jackson's every move and decide to scrutinize whatever it was he did because the media was able to capture it on a film and run it over and over and over again to the point that that's all we remember. Well, and put it on the splash on the covers of, of, of rag magazines endlessly. Well, okay, like the, like the media, uh, this documentary film company, Jinx, followed William Durst, right? And they caught him confessing to murder. And for one yeah, second. The movie. So great. he only did it for one second. He only held a baby out there for one second. He was only holding hands with this little boy and admitting he slept in a bit in the bed with this little boy for one second. Sure, it's all one second because we, we were lucky enough to capture this on film and see what he was doing. Okay, look, I see that this is going to go nowhere with you. Well, you only got a couple of minutes anyway. I get your point. Yeah. You think he's guilty. I'm telling you I think he's not. And I think we need to leave it at that because I am not going to continue to go around the rosy with you on this. I could, but I'm getting aggravated, and I really don't like to be aggravated in interviews. It's okay, now I can tell you're being aggravated. I don't want you to be aggravated. Okay, uh, we only, we only got a couple minutes left anyway. Okay, great. Because <laughs> right. I'm not going to convince you, and you're not going to convince me. Well, no, of course not. But uh, no. you know, uh, I'm sorry you didn't enjoy your time on the show. I really am. Because uh, I don't yeah. enjoy it. I just don't like to be so so so. Uh, argumentative it's just not my not my style okay you know i mean really well, and, g- and clearly we are not going to convince each other no no i i'm i'm very convinced of this case i i've been dealing with this, I'm for, very yeah, convinced yeah, of this case. before the yeah way before uh, okay um I'm, I'm very convinced way after right very convinced you want to real oh. quick tell us about cruel sacrifice cruel sacrifice is a story of four teenage girls that killed, tortured, and burned alive a 12-year-old girl because of a lesbian love triangle that, for whatever reason, they decided a 12-year-old knew she was a lesbian. It mm. is the most twisted tale of psychological trauma and how these girls got to be where they were through peer pressure and bizarre home behaviors of their families is really what the book's about. So the crime is something that happens early on, but it's really the psychological drama that leads these girls at 15 and 16 years old to do what they did. And that's what the book explores, and it tells it through the eyes of the, ch- of the teenagers, of the, of the girls who I inter- whom I interviewed. Um, it's a very compelling, mortifying story about something that happened in America with teen violence that before any of the teen violence that we're quote-unquote used to seeing these days. And frankly, I, when I wrote it, I had no idea that it would have the impact it did on teens and coming generations, but it has, and it was a cult classic back in time, and it is now just been released as an ebook and it's already number 15 on Amazon and that's because it's a completely different story than Michael Jackson. I'm not trying to convince anything anyone of anything in it. I'm chronicling something that happened, a crime that never should have happened 
and why the backdrop, as I talked to you in the beginning of this interview, why some of the signs, many of the signs which were ignored should not have been. Okay, Aphrodite, we got 10 seconds left. We got 10 seconds left. Thank you so much, Aphrodite Jones. We were talking about Michael Jackson conspiracy and also cruel sacrifice. Uh, it's just re released right now. Investigation Discovery, 9 p.m. Monday nights. Thank you so much, Aphrodite Jones. Thank you, Ed.